Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. With us is the distinguished writer Holly Peterson, author of six books and four novels. Her first novel, The Manny, written in 27, is a satire of the lives of wealthy people in New York City. It quickly rose to the New York Times bestseller list. She followed The Manny with It Happens in the Hamptons and The Idea of Him, also novels of social satire. The Idea of Him is a love story of a woman who is trying to figure out if she's in love with the man or just the idea of him. Hilarious premise, full of ideas. Her latest release this summer has the seductive title of It's Hot in the Hamptons. It starts with two women sitting on a bench in Sag Harbor saying, let's have affairs this summer. What happens next? Do they really go through with it? This is one you can't put down. A former contributing editor for Newsweek, editor-at-large for Talk Magazine, and an Emmy award-winning producer for ABC News, Holly has contributed to Town & Country, Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and many other publications. She's also currently writing a weekend column on lifestyles for the London Financial Times. I am pleased to welcome Holly Peterson to this table. Well, thank you so much for having me. So now you've written fiction and nonfiction. Yes. Which is tougher to do? Well, I always say fiction brings you closer to the truth because as a journalist, you're constrained by interviews and what people say and if you were there, if you weren't there. And when you're writing fric fiction, you can actually be at the dinner party. You can be at the boardroom table. And as long as you're writing in a way that reflects reality, which I do because I've been a journalist for 30 years, I fact check my novels. Fact I check it, your novel. Oh, absolutely. How do you fact check a novel? It's because all Because you're up. referring to how much a roast costs at Lobel's Market on Madison Avenue. You got to call them. You can't make that. You can't make up anything, otherwise it isn't authentic or truthful. You're going to lose your audience. That's why so many things about rich people get silly because people imagine this nonsense that isn't truthful, and then it becomes silly caricatures. I write truthful fiction. All right, it's so very now, realistic. now you uh, have written two novels about the Hamptons, mm -hmm. that uh, emporium of wealth on the eastern end of Long Island, uh, where masters of the universe convene and uh, tell each other how rich they are. Mm -hmm. What fascinates you about the Hamptons? A summer community has testosterone-fueled inequality in it because you have a vibrant local community that lives there all year round. Right, no matter what the summer community is, even testosterone in a, fueled, not estrogen fueled. No, testosterone fueled because the difference is so enormous and so hypercharged between the haves and the have lesses, right? That it's absolutely ripe for parody and satire. I mean, in a summer community like the Hamptons, you've got teachers and vintners and architects and all kinds of people that live there all year round, and then you've got these summer people that come in like an invading army, as you know well expecting the world to be handed to them on a platter. And the tension between the locals and the summer community provide great everything. They, you know, tension is the lifeblood of a writer. It provides obnoxious moments. It creates, you know, great sex scenes, uh, you know, arguments that are really about much more than whatever they're arguing about, that are arguing about inequality and entitlement and someone's character and how you treat people and what you expect of people and, you know, all kinds of things. So tension is the lifeblood of the writer. How does this clash play out in, uh, in, in my your, current book? In, in your current book. Well, in my current book, I wanted to write. I always write about the wealthy because I. They wear I, better, Fitzgerald. You know so. what? It's just what I do. Um, you know, I grew up in New York. I grew up uh, with a ba with a banker dad and a rather privileged situation, and it's something that I know. And writers write best about what they know. And there's not a lot of um, authors and journalists out there who grew up the way I did. And I see stuff that is so outrageous and so outlandish, and I'm always looking for a good story, that I feel I have to report on it. So as I was saying at the beginning, when I write a novel or when I write a column for the FT, I do it the same way. I'm trying to expose something that is outrageous and interesting and hilarious and sad and tragic and all kinds of things all at once. So Fitzgerald said the, also said the, the rich are different from you and me. Of course. How are they different? They're different because they're so neurotic, you know? Neurotic? Oh, you mean yeah. a, a truck driver or a plumber isn't neurotic? I believe that wealthy people in New York 
are a group, a particular brand of rich people, very worthy of satire, who are unique in their sense of never having enough, uh, total entitlement to have what they want, when they want, status how they seeking. want, status seeking, relentlessly seeking attention and recognition, not happy with what they have, and often not very elegant about what they have in the face of others who might have less. Now, many of them are highly competitive with uh, one another on Wall Street. I get that. But then they go out to the Hamptons. They're supposed to relax. No, it's even worse. They're supposed to lie of on the course. beach. Of course. Like Which guys at play? Are you kidding? But, it's even worse. Well, what happens out there? What happens to them? People want to, people, you know, rich people, you got to think about them as like a pack of dogs. They want other, pe they sniff each other out and they want other people to know who's the alpha dog and who's the boss. And there's various ways of doing that that are not actually that subtle. You can do it by what car you drive, you can do it by what house you live in, by how much art you pack in the house. But if people don't see you drive and they're not invited over to your house, then it has to be glided into conversations so that people understand your wealth and your stature and where you come from and how far you've come and what your station is. It's, it's, it's a bizarre thing among rich New Yorkers that I love to look at and write about and parody and tease. Mm, tease. Well, you certainly do tease. What about celebrities in the Hamptons? Uh, Spielberg is supposed you to be out what? there, Zucker and I, uh, Martha Stewart. Uh, if I were to walk on the beach in uh, Watermill or East Hampton, would I run into them lying on the beach like beach whales or are they in hiding? Hollywood celebrity is different. You have Madonna in the Hamptons. You have Jay-Z in the Hamptons. Jay-Z, he's my yeah. namesake. Oh, exactly. He's, and so much like you. <laughs> um, you have Renee Zellweger, I think I've seen in a bar a few times. You, set, you have some Hollywood out there, but I think Hollywood neuroses and Hollywood need for affection and recognition is somewhat the same, but that's, that's different. Hollywood needing to act, needing applause, it's the same type of thing, but it's a very different group of people, and I would say different social mores and different behavior patterns, if I'm speaking as an anthropologist. Now, is, is there mating that takes place in the Hamptons? I mean, uh, or uh, coupling up? I mean, suppose a master of the universe ran into Renee Zellweger in the bar. Would he go over to her and say, hi, I'm worth a billion dollars, and uh, uh, buy you a drink? He probably would. He wouldn't say I'm worth a billion dollars, but he would start talking about his pilot. His private, of his he, private plane. Yes, and he would start letting people, when any, as you and I have said in the past, when anyone starts talking about their pilot, what they're really saying is, I spend $80,000 on a round trip airfare instead of 600 or 500 or 800. That's what they're saying. So when they start name dropping their pilot or saying wheels up, um, which means, which is pilot. pilot's lingo for takeoff time. You know, when they start name dropping all that, they really only have one goal in mind. You, they don't, you know, they know you don't care about their pilot. They're just trying to get the other person to know that they're super loaded. I think you wrote about uh, some guy out there who was complaining that his pilot didn't know how to make a good sandwich. Exactly. So. I. I write... Um, what would Renee Zellweger uh, <laughs> think if I were to tell her that my pilot doesn't know how to make a good sandwich? I mean, women are pretty turned off by it. You know, that's <laughs> oh, they the are. Iron, irony, yeah. Um, you know, I do this column for the Financial Times, and we decided to call it Wheels Up, right, for that purpose. It's, it's about wealthy people, how they live, how they um, love excess, how they misbehave, and kind of the psychosis of success and money and power and how that all intersects and how it works on the inside. And so we thought calling it wheels up would be apt because it's really like going aloft with these people. So let's talk about it's hot in the Hamptons. Okay. Is it hot in the Hamptons or is it's it cool in the Hamptons? It's always hot in the Hamptons. Hamptons. It's always hot in the Hamptons. Hot. Now, what do you mean by hot? You mean sexy? Or yes. Sexy. Absolutely. Okay. Sex sells. What do you think? Sex sells. Trying sure. to sell books. So you wrote this uh, storyline. Yeah. And uh, uh, tell us a little more about it. Two women are sitting on a bench in Sag Harbor. Okay. And, uh, let, let me explain a few things to you. Two white girls sitting around talking. <laughs> here's, here's what it is. Um, when I write a book, I, I take it like a cover story to a magazine. I have a theme.
that I believe is fresh and needs to be exposed or needs to be examined in some way. I don't just say, let me do a story about boy meets girl and girl, you know, whoever gets who at the end, whatever all that stuff is. I don't approach it that way. I say, there's this thing going on in society and I can fictionalize this whole thing and say a lot about where we are right now in, you know, 2019 in ways that I want to that I think and hope people are interested in. So when I wrote Hot in the Hamptons, I really wanted to write about women, sexuality, and the Madonna whore complex. I wanted to write about... What's the Madonna whore complex? Okay. The Madonna whore complex is something that men do when they look at women, and some women do, in the sense... Not all men. Not all men. No, and not all women. But men in general, or some men, or a lot of men, feel that when a woman is very sexualized, it's easier to label her as kind of slutty, over the top, dangerous, sometimes deranged in a way. I mean, this is why people get punished, women get punished for adultery and for being sexual in a lot of countries and certainly in our country's past. And certainly in literature. And certainly in literature, my Anna God. Anna Karenina was Anna punished. Karenina jumps on the train tracks. Madame Bovary guzzles arsenic. I mean. Well, she ate arsenic. Well, whatever, okay, you know. But, um, it's so funny. <laughs> and, um, you know, women get punished for being and sexualized. Hester Klein wore a big scarlet exactly. letter A. Exactly. Scarlet so letter A. All right, so, so they're both all stigmatized women. So here are your two women. My, and, and I didn't want to do that, okay? I wanted to write women characters who were mothers. Mothers. Who, who were sexual and married outside their, their, their marriage. Because I can't think of a movie or book that's really examine that deeply and I'm these, not these two women are in their 40s aren't these they? These two women are in their 40s. Now you've said that's a dangerous time. It's a dangerous I, I think time. the grandmother of one of the women says it's a dangerous time. <laughs> you read time my book very book. carefully. Oh, I, yes, You're a very good journalist. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm the not 40s. A good journalist. Are... I was fascinated. Okay. I mean I thought I was getting ready for a sex scene so I really wanted to get into it. Okay so going back to the thesis okay People look at women as Madonna or whores, as women who are mothers, who are good women, capable of you know, immaculate conception, all this stuff, or highly sexualized, right? It's very seldom that you take a mother who's a good mother and a good wife that's portrayed in literature or film as also having a hot affair on the side and not, and like, okay, and still a good mother and still a good wife, because men do that all the time, right? Men have affairs. And they're seen as bad boys and virile, and you know they're so bad when they go to Vegas. So you think there's a overseas. double there's a double standard? I think there's absolutely a double standard, but more than a double standard, and I think more interesting than a double standard, is that how do we look at women who act on this the way men do? What happens? What happens to the women? What happens to their relationships? What happens to the husbands that find out? What happens to them themselves in terms of beating themselves up or being angry at themselves or feeling ashamed? What happens to their sense of liberty to do exactly what their husbands are doing? I mean, what does it all mean when you're a good mom and you're a good wife and you stray? Now, I made it both these women strays because their husbands strayed. I'm not pro-affair, but I wanted it you're to be... You're affair neutral. Yeah, I'm a fair, well, I, I don't think affairs are great things in any case, but if the husbands are doing it, I wanted to give the reader a reason to say, okay, maybe maybe it's fair that they do that. By it's the not way, just you being said, you like said disloyal. In fiction, you uh, do fact checking. Yes. Uh, are you aware of any situation in in reality where two women sat on a bench in Sag Harbor and said, "Let's have an affair this summer"? I'm not, <laughs> but I can imagine that, right? And that's why fiction is fun. It's plausible, and that's why fiction, in the end, though it's lonely and difficult, is in many ways more fun than journalism because you get to imagine these things and play out, in my case, extremely realistically and factually as best I can what might happen. So that's why I wrote this book. I believe we live in a world that is not terribly comfortable with women's sexual agency, them being in charge of what, what they want to do. What is sexual agency? That means a woman deciding whether she's married or not married or in a relationship or young or old or really old, deciding this is what I want sexually at this point in my life, and this is what I'm going to do to, to get it. So you see I think that's a good thing. That's a good thing for a man or a woman. To be in charge of their own sexuality. Yes. Pretty basic. It's pretty basic. You know. It's pretty basic to have her in charge and not have a man that she's with 
or another woman, you know, saying, no, it, this is the way it's going to be. We're going to be in an office and I'm going to tell you to do this if you want to keep your job or we're going to be in a relationship and this is how I like sex so this is the way we're going to do it because I'm the guy and I'm stronger or, you know, or a million, a million reasons that women aren't necessarily in control of how their sex lives play out. So Carolyn and Annabelle, your two yes. characters, and the principal one is Carolyn. Yeah. And uh, she fascinated me throughout the book. But uh, do they both go ahead and have affairs? They do. They do? Yeah. And so what happens? Are they well, glad at I'm the end they had them? Don't give it away. But I'm not I mean going to give it away. They do it, and they question themselves, and they try to cover up their tracks, and it allows them both to have a clearer look on what their husbands have done all along and what they think of their husbands, and do they want to stay with their husbands? It kind of opens up a lot of possibilities about new avenues for their lives and ways to find kind of a weird sense of parity with their husbands, which means a weird sense of equality. And um, as I said, I'm not pro doing all this, but I wanted to write a book about all this because I think it's interesting to people. Do you think it's possible in a marriage to have an affair and keep the marriage together? I don't really think it's very easy. I think what happens is the scar tissue is so immense that it's really hard for the other person not to bring it up at every other meal or every other cocktail situation. I mean, I think it's extremely difficult to get over. So it's not necessarily um, without reason that people, that it destroys relationships and really complicates things. That's why I say I'm not for it. Even, I don't think it's easy to do. Even if it happens in the Hamptons? Even if it happens in the Hamptons. Yes. It's just a, you know, the Hamptons is a fun environment within which to write because, as I said, it's a t testosterone fueled summer community. You have the haves and the have lesses or the have nots. You have them all clashing up against each other with the same force as the Atlantic waves before them. And, you know, it gets like currents in the ocean. It gets super, super messy. I mean, the guy, the rich guy who's like trying to be down to earth because he grew up with nothing and hang out with his contractor, you know, invites him for a drink. And then, you know what, he doesn't treat him well when he invites him out for a drink. He, you know, gets cheap on the beer. Or he wants him to go after a drink and not stay for dinner or brings up the shelves that, you know, he screwed up on just to show the power. I mean, it's not easy for people of different incomes to perfectly socialize with each other or to work with each other. Okay, so you're a feminist, right? I'm a very radical feminist. Radical feminist. Yes. And, and you wrote, would you characterize and your, I think that's your a books good thing. as uh, radical feminist books? Yeah. I mean, I'm a radical feminist in that I believe that women should do what they want to do in life the way they want to do it. And they should have the power to do that. And they should find situation. And we should all men and women create environments where there's equality between people. I mean, this the reason all this stuff, James, is so interesting because it all brings up greater issues about society. Is inequality in our country that is getting so massive, is that a good thing in any way? No, it's not good for anyone. Well, you're talking about right? uh, economic inequality yes. and uh, uh, inequality in the workplace yes. and all very important issues, None gender of it's inequality. Good. I don't believe any of it's good. I don't believe any of it helps even the people at the top. If there's massive inequality and you're at the top, you're living in a much more fragile economic environment. It's much harder for you to do business, right? If you're in an office and you've got exactly the same type of person working in all the echelons of power, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Something's going to happen where you're insensitive to a group of people and you're going to get pilloried in the press or you're going to ignore a market because you don't know anything about it because you don't have that voice at the boardroom table, or you're not going to recognize something you have that can help a whole other market that's right before your nose because you don't have that whole other market, you know, as your director of retail or whatever. And so being inclusive, I really philosophically believe, makes the circle stronger, as kind of dorky and corny as that sounds. If you think of society as a circle of people holding hands, if there's weak links, the whole thing doesn't work as well. If people around it are comfortable and have agency and can control a lot of aspects of their lives and can get what they want, maybe it's just a house, it's not a plane, but can do that, 
everything works better for everybody. So are the strong links the women and the weak links the men? No, men not can be strong too. Men can be strong too? Yes, I'm not anti-man. Okay. No, well, no real feminist is, no is anti-man. Well, uh, I don't believe. Let's go back to uh, uh, women in their 40s. Yeah. Women on the verge. Women on the verge. Uh, should, I mean, is there a vaccine to prevent them from uh, making some fatal mistake? I think women in their 40s. What's wrong with them? Well, it's the same thing as men in their 40s, right? Like, people in their 40s reevaluate a bit, and that can cause dangerous situations. In your teens, you're just a big hot mess, right? In your 20s, you're trying to figure out who you are and establish yourselves and find a mate. In your 30s, you're sinking your teeth into your job and your marriage and your kids and whatever situation you've chosen, and you're too tired to even think about, was this, any of this a good idea? You hit 40, whether you're a man or a woman, and you say, wait a minute, my wife or husband bores me to tears, or I hate my job, or I'm going nowhere and this sucks. Like, it, it provides a little bit of breathing room and a little bit of perspective from which to say, oh my goodness, I want to change things. And Time when that happens, causes dangerous situations. It can be sex, it can be leaving your job, it can be sleeping with a yoga teacher. For a lot of men, for some reason, it seems to happen a lot. It can be all kinds of things. But I think it's mutual. And I think women in their 40s are kind of done with the kid thing. So it's a special brand of wanting perspective or wanting new things. Holly, let's talk a little bit about the process of writing. Okay. Uh, how long did it take you to produce this wonderful book? I mean, my first book I wrote in six months at night with a full-time job in my 30s having kids. How I did that, I have no idea. I just wanted to write about a male nanny on Park Avenue, and it, like, puked out of me on the page in six months. My second book, That's I didn't... That's a recipe for bestseller. Let it I puke mean, out of you. I mean, go figure. My second book, I worked on for three years with no job and was just an immense struggle. Third book was about a year. Fourth book was about a year. It takes me about a year. And I get up at 4 a.m., and I make tea and little banana and peanut butter hors d'oeuvres. Banana I, and peanut butter yes, hors d'oeuvres. Little round things with peanut butter. I like to taste them. They're excellent. And I write for three hours, kind of with a candle burning, and I turn off the email, and I turn off the internet, and the house is asleep, and the kids are asleep, and the dogs are asleep, and I get a real three hours of excellent work completed with the world not bothering me. And you're banging this out on the computer. And I bang it out on the computer, and then I go to the library for another three hours at some point during the day. And there's a great program called Mac Freedom where you can turn off the internet. Turn off the internet? On your computer. So you can't bet it back on without turning it on and off. It's like a whole thing getting it, the internet to work again. And you set it by time. So I go to quiet places and I turn off the internet. And I don't write at, you know, when I'm super frazzled because it's just not going to work. And do you do this fact checking on the internet? I have to, yeah. But I can do that later. I write, you know, journalism is a work, there's TK, which means this, the facts will come later to come later. So I put TK, TKs all over my fiction manuscripts meaning I'll figure out who was president then, or I'll figure out how much a surfboard costs, or I'll figure out how much a private plane to you know, Hong Kong is. You know, well, I'll do that all later. Are you working on another book? I'm going to do a book on the art world next. On the art world? Yeah. Sex in the art world? Definitely. Definitely. Sex in the art world in the Hamptons or somewhere else? Um, probably in the Hamptons. Probably in the Hamptons. <laughs> yeah. My publisher likes me to stay in the Hamptons. Yeah. So well, if it my works. last book at Hot in the Hamptons, um, you know, make a stick to your last. But I know, I know. That's marvelous. But yeah. um, how uh, there is a, an art world component in the Hamptons. There's never been Jackson Pollock. And, uh, well, there's a lot of great Krasner, artists that live there. De Kooning. Yeah, De Kooning and Pollock and all those people. But the art world again is another microcosm through which to view the frenzy in which we live these days, you know, the, the, the trying to get the thing first, the trying to know the thing first, the rushing after something because you saw it on Instagram and you don't even know if you like it, you just want it, you know, the, um, the desire among the wealthy to expose their wealth and to show their culture, you know, there's all kinds of conspicuous interesting conspicuous consumption themes and there's also, I was talking about this with my daughter this morning who's applying to colleges and just, and I explained to her, I said, you know, the most interesting person often doesn't win in the end, you know, the greatest artist 
don't get recognized, and the greatest writers don't get recognized very, very often, unfortunately. And bestsellers and hot artists and you know blockbuster movies are not necessarily the greatest pieces of culture and art. Um, but and some of them are recognized. So I have a question for you. But Holly. some of them are, yes. Yes, some of them are. So, so I have, obviously, I have, I have some. a question Thank God. for you. Or it'd be the Holly end of Peterson, society. I have a question for you. I'm listening. And the question is, what goes into uh, someone being a good writer? I mean, I think I'm a good writer. I don't think I'm a great writer. I'm not a literary writer. I think I'm good at depicting what the scene is and, and using kind of concise short sentences to kind of say it as it is and not be scared to say it as it is. But, you know, I think you have to really think about your audience and are you boring them and are, is this worthy of their interest? So the I mean, key to it is thinking about your audience. That's kind of what I do. Yeah. I mean, I try to entertain and, and keep the pages turning. Yeah, okay. I really do. This has been wonderful. Holly thank Peterson, you. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much me. for coming by. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. Don't forget to catch my book, Plaintiff in Chief, A Portrait of Donald Trump in 3,500 Lawsuits, available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your favorite bookstore. Take care and all the best. I'm Jim Zirin.